Today, the date is 31st January 2020, right? Exactly 100 years ago, on this day, that is 31st January 1920, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar published his, began publishing his newspaper called Mook Nayak. Mook means silent and Nayak means hero. But it's not the hero who is silent. He is the hero of those who are silenced. So Dr. B. R. Ambedkar started his uh, foray into journalism by founding this paper called Mook Nayak exactly 100 years ago. Because he recognized, he realized that journalism is one important field that I must make my own. If I want to make my voice reach my own people but also to the powers that be. So journalism in that sense became very important in independent India but even before that in uh, colonial India. And uh, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar made a very good use of it. And in, in, in a certain sense he is the one who started this uh, journal, this newspaper because he said that the general the media is not really representing us. The, the, the larger media houses, they are not really talking about things that interest us. So we want the depressed classes whom we now call Dalits, they want their own, they need their own press. So they started his Mook Nayak. Now it's very interesting to know that the man Jyotira Phule, who Ambedkar used to call his guru, right? Ambedkar used to call Jyotira Phule his guru. And this was the problem that Phule had in his life also. He said that the perspective, the ideas, the demands of our people, people who are marginalized, people who are silenced, they are not finding any platform. So, but he was a writer, and where would he write? Jyotiro Phule was writing in a magazine called Gyanodaya, published from Ahmed Nagar, and it was founded in 1842 by the American Marathi Mission. So it was the American Marathi Mission which was giving platform to Jyotiro Phule to express his views. And then we saw that there, were, there came a time when uh, people had their own presses. Uh, and we know that 100 years before uh, Ambedkar, it was Joshua Marshman and his son, uh, John Clark Marshman, who founded three newspapers in uh, Calcutta. And we just talked about William Carey, that how he started three newspapers, Friend of India, uh, Samachar Darpan and Digdarshan. These are the three newspapers that were started by Joshua Marshman and uh, John Clark Marshman. And how that started actually uh, uh, a whole new uh, grammar of public sphere, the whole new uh, avenue for voicing your opinion. So missionaries, whether it's American Marathi mission in uh, Western India or uh, Friend of India in Eastern India, you see that the impact that they were uh, having. Now, the, the subject that I want to talk to you about today is literature, you know. Uh, what did missionaries do to, uh, to shape and even originate the modern uh, literature? Uh, we all have heard about Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, the great novelist, the great nationalist, uh, who wrote his Anand Mat and uh, Vande Matram comes from his novel and uh, he is often considered the father of novel in India. Uh, he was a great Bengali nationalist and he wrote some of the very famous novels and he wrote all of them in Bengali, right? But when he started his career as a writer, he, he wrote his first novel not in Bengali but in English. Bankim Chandra Chatterjee wrote his first novel in English and it was called Raj Mohan's Wife which was written in 1864 right. and that is considered to be one of the first novels of, uh, in India. But 
12 years before Bankim Chandra wrote his English novel, there was already a Bengali novel written. And that Bengali novel was written not by a Bengali, but by an English woman who was wife of a missionary. Catherine Hannah Mullins, who was born in 1826, she <coughs> published her novel in Bengali called Phulmani O Karunar Bibaran, the story of or the history of Phulmani and Karuna. So here you have, if you, if you notice the irony, that here you have an Indian, a Bengali, who began his writing career by writing in English, and there you have an English woman who actually wrote her first novel in Bengali, right? And uh, for a very long time, historians were a little ambivalent towards this novel, uh, Purmani uh, or Karuna, because it is very difficult sometimes to credit uh, a book written by a foreigner to be the first novel in your country. Right? But that is what it is. Catherine Hannah Mullins is the mother of novel in our country. She was wife of a missionary, daughter of a missionary, but she taught her, she was born in Calcutta, uh, Bengal certainly, and then she taught herself Bengali, and she taught her Bengali so well, herself Bengali so well, that she was able to write a full-fledged novel. Right? And the historians are now beginning to say that that novel indeed uh, claims, or uh, in fact, it, its claim to be the first novel is justified. But that's and the story is very interesting in that novel. If you see that um, uh, Catherine Hannah Mullins, she has a set of two sisters, right? the two Bengali women. Both of them are Christians, but one of them has uh, a very good uh, control over life. The other one is uh, a woman who is not living. Uh, her house is not clean. She's getting beaten by her husband because. Uh, you know, the way she speaks and everything is terrible. And how even this woman, uh, the, the spoiled one, she becomes a model woman. So it's basically that story uh, of these two uh, sisters. But of course, with these two sisters, there are a lot of other stories that go on in this uh, novel. And uh, you'd be very surprised to know that this is one book uh, which was way ahead of its time particularly with the choice of women. Uh, Phulmani, who is uh, very uh, a proper Christian, uh, she is finding it very difficult uh, to reconcile to the fact that her daughter, Phulmani's own daughter, Sundari, she has refused to marry a very good boy. Now, the boy is... Uh, you know, he's well settled, he's uh, doing a very good job, he's getting 25 rupees a month and uh, he's a Brahmin convert and uh, he follows the Lord and uh, the pastor is very happy and everything seems to be fine but they go to Sundri and say, Sundri, why don't you want to marry him? He says, I don't know him. He says, come on, in Bengal, no girl knows the husband before she's married. You know, what, what, we, in England, yes, we can understand, you know, girls sometimes get to know their husbands before they're married. But you're in Bengal huh? and your parents uh, have selected uh, a groom for you. She says, I don't want to marry, I want to know him. He says, okay, let's, we'll give you this kind of freedom. We will allow you to go and meet the boy and you can talk to him and maybe you can get to know him and then you can marry him. He says, no, I don't want to marry him. Even then, he says, why? And then she says, because I'm in love with some other person. And this was shocking. He says, in, in our part of the country, we don't fall in love, right? And he says, who are you in love with? He says, I'm in love with the gardener's boy and him I want to marry. Now this is what the narrator of the story speaks in a very approving manner. He says, even if something hasn't happened in our society, doesn't mean that it will never happen or it should never happen. So even though the pastor and the other the parents, Purmani and Premchand are saying that how does it mean, uh, matter? You, you are a Christian, the boy is a Christian, why, do, why don't you get married? Then she says, she comes out with this very interesting uh, logic that 
it's not enough to be of the same religion. You have to have the same tastes, you have to have the same temperament, you have to have similar kind of likes, you know. So you, your com personality has to be compatible, you know. So this is very interesting. Now here is a missionary's wife writing this. And the novel allows her to, uh, you know, uh, ask these kind of very uncomfortable questions in a traditional society and traditional Christian society. So this is what uh, uh, Catherine Hannah Mullins uh, is, is, is uh, successful in doing. Uh, unfortunately, she died very young. She was still in her 30s when she died and she left one novel unfinished which was later completed by the rest of her family. So this is something very important for us to understand. It's not just that, that she wrote the first novel but what she wrote in that novel which is very important. So in Bengal, in India, you have this uh, missionary's wife, who is the mother of novel in India. But is she the only one? Is she an, uh, an exception to the rule? Right? Missionaries are here only to spread the religion. But that's not what they're here for. At least not the only thing. They always saw that they were here to, to reshape or transform the culture. So their engagement was much bigger than merely spread of religion. If you come back uh, or come down from uh, Bengal, from Calcutta to uh, Kerala, there you find there's another missionary woman, a missionary wife rather, who writes another novel. And she writes in English. And uh, this novel came out uh, in 1865. 1866-67, it was serialized in a magazine, in a college magazine, Kotaya. And uh, she wrote a novel called The Slayer Slain. Uh, or in simple terms, The Killer is Killed. That's what she has written about. She again is uh, a white woman, uh, but she is uh, the second mother of a novel in India. Her story is simpler. Her novel is shorter, but there again she has at the center the uh, change of heart of a Syrian Christian landlord. The story is again very interesting. In him. Uh, this uh, Syrian Christian landlord has a group of Pulaya uh, slaves who work uh, on his field, and Pulayas are supposed to be the lowest among the lowest of the castes. And uh, slowly these Pulayas become Christians and they come to their master and say that Master, uh, we want to work for you very very honestly. Uh, earlier we used to actually steal from you but after we became Christians we don't steal anymore and we don't shirk work but we have one request, kindly give us one day off so that we may worship. So they want a Sunday off. Now Koshi Kurian, the uh, Landlord, he says, You guys are only making excuses. You just want to, don't want to work. You are lazy. I won't give you uh, any uh, chutti. I won't give you any leave, any weekly off. So there were things, and you know, uh, this landlord becomes very angry. He picks up a stick to hit him, and uh, unfortunately, a little child is killed. And uh, you know, things kind of, so he becomes the killer. Koshi Korean because he inadvertently kills a little child. But by the end of the novel we see that his own heart is changed and he realizes that uh, he cannot treat his slaves like that and he finds the true light of the gospel and is converted and becomes a true believer. And this again, this novel was for a very long time not discussed, not very well known. We did not even know the name of the writer of this uh, novel. For a very long time, people only called it, the writer is Mrs. Collins, because they didn't even know what her first name was. Uh, she was known as Mrs. Richard Collins. I have one edition where it is Mrs. Richard Collins. Then I have another uh, edition of the book where it says uh, Francis Wright Collins. So now we know what her real name was. So these uh, <coughs> women, these missionary wives, they were the ones who brought some of the earliest novels to us. Uh, 
this talk of mine will have names and books, so this will basically a survey, and probably towards the end I'll be able to make some kind of uh, comments on the significance of all this. But apart from these two missionary women, uh, what about the Indian writers, the Indian Christian writers? Uh, that is also very significant. That uh, now we don't even have Christians reading the novel, right? But there was a time when Christians were actually not only reading but writing novels. They were among some of the pioneers. They were pioneers in the sense that many of these languages have their first novels written either by Christians or by the Christian converts. So I have already told you the first Bengali novel is written by a missionary woman, uh, Catherine Hannah Mullins. The first Bengali novel, uh, of course, and then if you come to the western coast, the first Marathi novel. The first Marathi novel which came in the year 1857 called Yamuna Pariyatan was written by Reverend Baba Padmanji. His, those who study the church history may have come across this name Baba Padmanji, Reverend Padmanji, who wrote the first Marathi novel, Yamuna Pariyatan. And like all the novels of that time which were concerned with social issues, social reform movement, his novel was also uh, related to a social reform movement, a social issue called the widow remarriage. And uh, Yamuna Pariyatan was considered or is considered the first novel in Marathi language written by a reverend. <coughs> then, is Reverend Padmanji an exception among the Indian Christians? No, he's not. Because when you go again to the south and go to Tamil Nadu, you see which was the first Tamil novel which was written. The Tamil, uh, first Tamil novel was called Pratap Madhuliyar Charitram, The Life and Times of Pratap Madhuliyar, <coughs> written in 1879 by a man in the service of the British uh, East India Company government. Uh, the name was Samuel Vedanaikam Pillai. He was a Catholic and he was a Munsif, he was in the courts and he wrote, he, he was an accomplished poet to begin with but he discovered the power of prose writing, he was a poet but then he decided to write in prose and uh, he wrote, he gave us the first Tamil novel, Pratap Mudaliyar Charitra. So uh, you have Baba Padmanji, you have Catherine Hannah Mullins, you have assembled with an icon building. Uh, what about the first English novel? I have just told you that the first English novel was uh, uh, written by Pankim Chandra Chatterjee, Raj Mohan's wife. But there are critics who say that uh, actually the, the, the uh, title of the first English novel should go to the novel called Govind Samant or the Bengal peasant's life, which came 10 years after uh, the novel by Bankim Chandra Chatterjee. But it is a more significant work because we did not know about Bankim Chandra's novel till about 1935 when it was discovered. Uh, so the first novel, and, and the second thing they say that uh, it is more of a romantic and adventurous tale. It is not really a proper novel. Now you must know that, you know, we call a novel novel because it is more realistic. Otherwise it would be a fantasy, otherwise it would be maybe an epic, maybe a legend, maybe a saga, right? Maybe a romance, but it will not be a novel. The novel is marked by realism, right? You have the space and time and everything believable. So the first novel in English actually, according to one of the critics, should be Govind Samant by a priest. Uh, you must have heard the name of Reverend Lal Bihari Day. So Reverend Lal, Lal Bihari Day uh, arguably wrote the first English novel in India. And again it's a very interesting story. Uh, I'll go, go into the story later but let me talk about one other uh, novel. See the Indians uh, and Indian Christians at that time were involved in social reform. They were not just into uh, evangelism, which they were doing, but they were also into social reform 
which was part of their evangelistic work and that reform and evangelistic work crystallized in the form of books and many of these novels came out of that. The other writer that I want to talk to you about is Shivanti Bai Nikambe. Now she was a Marathi. She wrote her uh, first novel in 1895 called Ratan Bai. Now, Ratan Bai is the story of a child bride, a girl who uh, got married at nine uh, nine, when she was nine years old and uh, by 11 she has to go to her husband's house and her father wants to, her to get uh, educated, the rest of the family doesn't want her educated. So there are a lot of those uh, things going on. So Shivanti Bai Nikambe, uh, she wrote that novel, she dedicated it to Queen Victoria and uh, she wanted that novel to contribute in social reform. So it's very interesting. Now while Catherine Hannah Mullen, the other important thing to know there is that while Catherine Hannah Mullen's novel and uh, Francis Collins' uh, novel, they had Christian characters. When we come to the novels of Lal Bihari Day, uh, Pratap Adliya uh, by Samuel Vedanayakam Pillai and Shivanti by Nikambe. We find that in all these three novels, you did not have Christian characters. They chose, these writers chose, because most of them were either first or second generation converts, they decided to write about the communities that they came from. So you had in these novels uh, stories not of Christians, but the stories of Hindu households. And they were told with a uh, lot of sympathy. With the, you see, novel allows you to be very objective, right? Uh, it allows you, because it, it, it's a kind of a genre where you can be self-reflexive, where you can question your own self, right? And where you do have to do that. If you want to write a good novel, you can't preach. You can't make it propaganda. A good novel is the novel which is aware that we have limitations. So when we read the novel by, for example, uh, Lal Bihari Day, you realize that this person, he is, because at that time you do not have many English speaking Indians to whom he can write, so he is directing his speech. The narrator is always talking to the uh, English readers. And the way he depicts Indian situation, you realize that he is always defending. He is almost like an apologist for the Indian way of life. Now, you would always be saying that you uh, English people may think that Indians are uh, crazy in doing this or crazy in doing that, but there is a reason they do this, right? He, 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 for example, things like, you know, why should you put like mustard oil in your babies and put them out into the sun? He will tell you why to do that. And he will tell you why in India, uh, you know, why the Bengali peasant considers a cow his mother, right? Now he said that you may, you know, find it uh, very strange and maybe uh, filthy that these people use the dung, cow dung, to plaster their house. You know, but I'll tell you what, what the reason is. So you come to realize that this novel that he's writing is also, it, it is imbued with this feeling of self-respect and a certain kind of incipient nationalism. So much before uh, Gandhi's and Nehru's uh, come on the scene, we already have these novelists and some of them reverends who are infusing a sense of self-respect and confidence in Indians. So it's almost like a proto-nationalism, an incipient nationalism that you begin to see in these books. So, uh, similarly with the Pratap uh, Madhuliyar Charitram, there again, he doesn't tell you a story about a Christian household or a Catholic household. He tells you a story about a Madhuliyar household, uh, you know, a middle caste and uh, they are uh, landlords and they have, uh, and it tells them about the foibles, the silliness in that families, but it also has a very high regard of women. Uh, even though the novel is named after a man, Pratap Mughliya, if you read the novel, you realize that the novel actually celebrates a heroine. The novel doesn't have a hero. The hero is a buffoon. You know, it's actually his wife, uh, Gyanambal, you know, a woman of wisdom, who is the actual, actual hero. Uh, and not just uh, the hero's wife, 
but even his mother. Now these are the two women he speaks very highly of. So much so that uh, there's, a, there's an episode in this novel when the husband and wife get separated. You should read this novel because it, it's, it's very entertaining like many of our South Indian films actually. Uh, so the husband and wife get separated, the wife disguises as a man and then she, because she's very uh, wise, she's made a king. Right? She's made a king of a province and she rules it very well. So much so that uh, one of the ladies want to marry him. You know, and then she has to reveal that she's not really a woman. Uh, she's not a man, she's a woman. So it's a very interesting, a funny uh, thing. But uh, it tells you uh, that the earliest Indian writers, the earliest Indian Christian writers, they were exploring themes which were, you know, um, which were much larger than their narrow uh, life. Similarly, as I told you about Shavantibai and Nikambe, the other very important novelist of that time was uh, uh, Krupabai Satyanathan. Many of you may have heard, a lot of people are working on her now, and she is uh, quite well known. Her first novel uh, was Saguna. Uh, Saguna was actually an autobiographical novel. So, Krupabai Satyanathan is credited to be the first autobiographical novel uh, in English by an Indian. That's what Krupabai did. So of course it is autobiographical, so she does have a lot of Christian characters. Uh, she talks about the conversion of a Brahmin father. Uh, but that is not all because the novel is about Saguna. Saguna was a first generation Christian, traditional Christian. But how she has to go through many different small conversions to be a true Christian. You know? so, uh, so it is, this novel in that sense raises a question, can you be a Christian if you are born in a Christian family? No, you have to go through your own process of uh, sanctification. That's a very interesting novel. It's her second novel which is again important because like the other three novels, this novel is again uh, does not have uh, any Christian character. She writes about uh, a young Brahmin woman, uh, uh, somebody actually like Pandita Ramabai. And her life. Right. Uh, so this is uh, the second novel is called Kamla. Uh, unfortunately, Krupa Bai Satyanathan also died very young. She was again in her thirties when she passed away. So, both by the missionaries and by Indian Christians, because novel by its very nature allows you to deal with difficult questions and difficult issues and complex issues and multi-layered issues at length and at leisure. And these writers were using the experience of conversion which itself is a very multi-layered process, which itself is a very complex process. So they found novel actually a very apt kind of a genre to discuss these changes that were taking place in the lives of, I mean, their own lives as well as of lives of the people around them. And that's why many of these novels you'd see, uh, particularly novels of Krupa Bhai Satyanathan, that have a very interesting psychological dimension to it. So even those people who dismiss the novels of the 19th century by saying, that these books are not really novels because there's so much of propaganda, they still cannot deny the uh, amount of, uh, or at least the level of greatness to Krupa Bhai's novels. Uh, so that's an important thing for us to uh, keep in mind. Um, then in 20th century, I think uh, Indians stopped reading, uh, certainly stopped writing, because our, maybe our, for whatever reasons, historians of the church can tell you better because our attention was diverted and we were doing something else. Uh, so these are some of the important contributions that these initial uh, writers were making. But okay, missionaries were writing, uh, Indian Christians were writing, <coughs> but what about the Indians who were not Christians? Right? That will also, I think, will give you a certain idea. So let's uh, just talk about it for maybe two or three minutes. Uh, it was not just the Indian Christians. The point that I'm trying to make is that it is not just the Indian Christians or the missionaries 
who were writing about the positive impact that gospel as well as the missionary movement was exerting on the Indian society of that time. One of the persons who really uh, assessed the transformative role that the Christian mission or the Christian missionary movement were playing in India again was uh, Jyoti Rao Bhule. Jyoti Rao Bhule, as you know, um, was in Maharashtra and uh, that is where the um, anti-caste movements are very strong. And uh, Jyoti Rao Bhule's uh, books are now be beginning to become uh, very well known. Uh, his book like Gulami or Cultivators, Whip God are the books people are talking about or Sarajani Satya Dharma and all, those are his non-fiction books. But very few people know that he also wrote one play. In the year 1855, Jyoti Rao Bhule, when he was only 28 years old, wrote a play which he wanted to send for some award called Tritya Ratna. Tritya Ratna means the third jewel, right? The third jewel or the third, the third jewel is basically a third eye, right? And what is he saying the third eye that we human beings have is education. So he said third eye, if you really want to progress in life, you need to open your third eye. And this third eye will open only when the education will come to you. It's basically a story of uh, a peasant uh, whose wife is expecting, she is about to have a baby. An astrologer comes to her house and says that, well, I see that your baby is in a lot of trouble, the planetary positions are terrible, something is going to happen to your baby, so you better give me some arms or do some kind of you know rituals, so the spell is broken. Uh, and these poor people, they do not have any money, so they actually borrow money to, you know, do these, uh, hold these feasts for this. And while this feast is going on, you know, all these uh, people, these uh, priests are sitting and eating, uh, this kunbi, the kunbis, uh, the peasant castes, they are sitting uh, very far from that house waiting, you know, for them to finish so that they can clean up and all. Then they have a missionary, a padri who comes and he begins to talk to them. Uh, and why you must you have to read that I can't tell you uh, the time we have. But it is this padri that who speaks to them, who begins to open their third eye, and that's the point that play is making, right? And today many of the Christians would be very embarrassed to write, you know, uh, that how missionaries have opened their eyes. You know, but here you, you have a person who is not even a Christian who is saying the transformation that is brought about by education, by enlightenment, that is brought by the missionaries. That was Juti Rapule. And some people got after him and said, Oh, you are a student of the missionaries. Huh? And this is uh, something that people will have to bear. And many people, they want to associate themselves with that. But again, uh, Jyoti Rapule wasn't the exception, he wasn't really the only one. Uh, there was in Kerala, in again 1890s, Pottari Kunjambu. He was uh, a writer from the Tiya class. From Tiya class, again, Pari Tappers, I think they are uh, among the lowest uh, in the caste ladder. Now, he wrote a novel. And his novel is also has kind of a similar tone as. Uh, Kule's play, he called his uh, novel Saraswati Vijayam. Now, Saraswati Vijayam means victory of education. And uh, in that novel, you will be very surprised to know, recently it has been translated into English. For a very long time, we did not know about this. Uh, it was only in Malayalam. In that novel, there is a Tiya character who is uh, beaten up, and people think he is dead. And, uh, Later on, we realized that this Tia man, uh, he was taken up by the missionaries and he got education and he <coughs> ended up being a judge of a court. So that was very strange because this Potari Punjam, who was a Tia by caste, he did not convert himself, he did not become a Christian. But he very freely wrote in his novel what conversion to Christianity was doing for the Tias. And that's very interesting. Pule and 
for Zalik and Jammu, you may say, are the exception, but no, they are not, because there is a third writer, he's a Tamil writer, A. Madhuriya. Now he writes a similar kind of a novel, which actually is a 20th century novel, 1915, uh, Clarinda. Now he, he writes how uh, a woman, when she becomes a Christian, how her life changes. Madhuriya never became a Christian. But all of them recognize the transformative potential of the gospel. And they all uh, wrote about that in their novels, in their books. So it's interesting to look at this whole configuration that is happening. Because social transformation is not just uh, you know, a cause and effect thing. As the sociologists have taught us, that you can't really say this is with this. But you have to see that how in the 19th century, the whole configuration was changing. The whole intellectual and social configuration was changing. How new ideas were uh, interacting with new values and beliefs and how new networks were being developed. And that is important to know because new networks were being de delivered. And it's very interesting to note that missionaries uh, went on to, if they did not write a novel, they translated it. For example, uh, Samuel Vedanayakam's novel, Pratap Mudaliyala, uh, Charitra, was, parts of it were translated by a missionary Mackenzie. Yeah. And uh, Frances Collins, when she died, the novel wasn't finished. Her husband, Richard Collins, wrote the last three chapters, and then in 1877, he translated the novel into Malayalam, uh, Ghatakavan, if you've heard of that. So the missionaries were not just writing novels, they were translating them. If they are in the vernacular, they were uh, translating in English. If it's in English, they were translating in vernacular. Uh, and, and interestingly, missionaries were not just translating the novels by Christians. The first novel written in Telugu language by Kandugo Yudhirisalindam, Raj Shekhar Chaitra. Now, Kandugo wasn't a Christian. But his novel was translated into English as Fortune's Wheel by an American uh, missionary, J. J. R. Hutchinson, I think, uh, J. Roberts Hutchinson. Now, he's the one who translated the novel into English. Now, if, if he translated, that means he had good command with it also. So, what would this novel, uh, what is the Christian contribution? It's much larger than that, the missionary contribution. They were writing novels, they were translating novels. <coughs> not only of Christians, but also of non-Christians. They opened their presses because people would come and publish their novels in their presses. They had the literary journals in which they would promote those works. So there was, you see that in the early 19th, early 20th century, the late 19th century, the whole reform movement was a joint exercise both by the Christian missionaries and Indian Christians and the Hindu and the Muslim social reformers. They were all coming together to effect that. And they used novel, they used literature, they used journalism in, in, in tandem with one another. So that's something uh, we, we need to look at. I have, I've, uh, okay, I'm three minutes over, uh, but I'll just quickly uh, say, you know, what does this mean? Why were uh, missionaries involved in writing of novels? You know, that is something that we need to know. The sociologists and even philosophers of religion, when they distinguish religions from one another, they will tell you what this religion really talks about and what this religion really stands for. So they would say that, okay, Christianity is a religion where doctrines are very important, where uh, statements are very important, dogma is very important, you need to believe. You cannot be a Christian unless you believe and faith and this, that and the other. And they say, okay, let's look at Hinduism. Hinduism is more about practice. It is about rituals. It is about conduct. So it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you know you act in a certain manner. But here you see that the novel is a genre which gives you an idea that this uh, this distinction is very uh, arbitrary in a way. Because why these novels were being written? Because missionaries knew that belief alone is not important. The belief has to be part of your character, it has to be seen in your life. And these novels were a first step, in fact they were the mirrors that they were, uh, in which you could see your future, that if you, uh, if you really uh, believe in God, if you really believe in the gospel, 
uh, that this is what your conduct should be. Right? And it told in a very non preachy manner. So, the Bible says that your faith is evident in your conduct. Right? The tree is known by its fruits. And this is what missionaries were doing, right? That your uh, belief, your faith will be seen in your fruits, in your actions, in your conduct. And this is what the novel was doing. So, novel tells you that reform was a joint project that has already told you. And uh, faith and action is another issue that gave rise to the novel. Uh, the other thing which is more philosophical and maybe we can discuss it in some other uh, on some other occasion is uh, with the coming of uh, the missionaries and the gospel a new conception of man and human life was also introduced in the world uh, in, 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 in at least this part of the world where man you realize is or the human personality is not an illusion human personality uh, has a great responsibility, a great burden of decision which will determine your eternity. So a certain kind of value was attached to, hum uh, to the human existence and to human action and to human will. And this became uh, the, the, the launch pad for the characterization in the novel. So your characters have to be autonomous moral beings. This is something that was uh, added uh, into our Indian society with the coming of the missionary and the exposition of the Bible. So these are a few things that I wanted to tell you. I have uh, some more stuff but maybe you should stop now and uh, we have 8 minutes uh, if you have any question or any comment. That in the general standard books on the history of the novel you don't find mention of the names that you've taken. So in that sense, it was very, very interesting for me. Uh, Krupabhai and Krupabhai and Shana. Shavanti Bhai. Yes, sir. Ramabhai. Ramabhai, yes. yes. These are mentioned, Rajmohan's wife, that is also mentioned. But the fact that these were preceded by others, so we didn't really hear about that. So I think it would be good to research this area and maybe write about it a little bit more because outside the Christian circle, I don't think people are aware of you know this work that's going on. So that was the comment that was followed by a question, which is in the larger context, uh, beyond literature. You know, a very common allegation that is made uh, against missionaries who have no doubt contributed immensely to multiple aspects of our lives, um, very important aspects of our lives. But the allegation is that often in their enthusiasm of evangelism, they were very disrespectful of native customs, of native rituals, uh, the person you mentioned who explained why uh, certain things are done, he was probably not the usual missionary. And, you know, by looking down on some of the native practices. So this kind of uh, attitude over a period of time built a lot of resentment in those who belong to the other religion. So would you care to comment about this and how far do you think this allegation is justified? So the first thing uh, that you said that yes, these names are missing in our literary history, uh, that's true. And as I said that it's only about three years ago that I began to ferret them out and uh, I've been writing about them. Uh, there's one paper that Samuel and I did uh, present and then I've written about it in a small book. Uh, there's a book, a big book, but my small chapter is there. Uh, I can make that available. Uh, Somehow didn't bring that book today. Uh, but yes, you're right. We need to write more about it and we need to have more uh, interactions like these. So, about the second uh, comment, um, yes, uh, there is over enthusiasm and uh, 
they did perhaps uh, said things which were not very uh, proper or maybe irreverent. Uh, but I also feel that these issues have become more contentious uh, with a certain kind of critical approach that we have taken towards history. For example, the issue of language. The words that are get, that get misinterpreted. Uh, for example, if somebody, a writer has written that uh, the crude religion of these simple people, you know. Now, uh, what is the value that we are ascribing to the word crude? You know, um, it may mean different things to different people. Yeah. So we. I think we need to continue to talk about it. Sometimes we try and give the contemporary meaning to ancient words. Now that creates problem. Uh, that is true. And then the other thing is, you when you talk about cultural uh, interaction, <coughs> you cannot escape, I think, uh, a certain level of confrontation which will come sooner or later. But I think what we can do is that we should separate this soul, but at least make distinguish is respect for the person and the respect for the idea. Uh, if that thing, I think, I, if we are able to somehow maintain that, uh, then probably it will be uh, more civil, more polite, and that <coughs> bad taste in the mouth uh, will not be there. Uh, the other thing, of course, is as I said, the the way we look at the past. You know, if you are looking at things from a particular standpoint, as students of literature, we know that we can look at any phenomenon uh, from Marxist point of view or from archetypal point of view. And these days, the post-colonial point of view uh, is something that we all subscribe to. Uh, but is that the best way to look at the past? I don't know. Uh, you know, I think this perspective also has its limitations. So we need to limit uh, we need to see the limits of our own perspectives. Uh, immense and which you have pointed out, my problem is with the current generation of Christians. Even though we know that we have done so much, then why are we so scared or timid uh, to present this uh, to the wider world that yes, we have done this. Why, why are we so scared? But, well, I think we, one issue is that uh, we do not, as man said, that uh, apart from this very small group, we don't actually know because knowledge is power. Once you know, then it gives you a certain self confidence, then you can go and speak. Uh, there may be theological problems also in the sense that uh, we are not told to read, for example. You know, we are not expected to read. Um, and there are congregations, there are homes where uh, they said, no, no, except for education, you should not read anything else. Uh, reading these kind of books is a waste of time, and some of them even go and say, these are demonic, and, you know, so what can we do about that? So that's, that's one thing. Um, so, and, so there may be theological issues, there will be uh, issues related to a particular church. Um, but yes, I think certainly there's a big communication gap. We need to speak, talk, and uh, take pride in this. Uh, and I think the, the the kind of Christian ministry we do sometimes uh, does shrink us in our thinking. You know, <clears throat> in the sense that uh, when we were growing up as young people, like part of a youth group, and they will teach you how to give your testimony, and so the testimony will be like three-point testimony. In three minutes it should finish, right? because you may never get a time to speak to the same person again. So you need to encapsulate it this, that, and the other. So we are always trying to find new techniques, rather than, uh, for example, right now, nobody is writing Christian autobiographies. Now who's writing it? I, I, I don't see it, you know, because we don't want to expand our experience. We don't want to uh, come to terms with our own complexity. Uh, we want to kind of encapsulate and shrink everything down to capsules and give to people. Uh, so I think the
the jet age, the digital age is taking its toll with our limited theology, I guess.